actually get one through these days. Well, first, let me. Uh, forward and then uh, conclude. In, in the background, I thought I would show you what drug discovery in the U.S. is like in terms of the process and, and estimates of cost and time. And um, this, this is from a, a report a little over a year ago from a Tufts University uh, study on the cost of drugs in the U.S., which is always controversial. Uh, but, and of course, this scheme applies uh, primarily to the big farm. Obviously, when you see a price tag of almost a billion dollars, no an academic institution is not <laughs> Engaged in that same uh, process. Uh, so the question is how then does an academic institution um, enter into this arena, which is so expensive to be in an area that big pharma has no interest because in, you can't compete with those resources. Um, you also have to be in an area that somebody is willing to provide some funds. And as um, noted here, we, we're fortunate to have funding from NIH, but the major funding for this kind of work has been from the Bill um, and Melinda Gates Foundation. But it certainly has not approached that kind of figure. And, and of course, academicians work a lot more economically than industry. But in, in any event, it's a, it's a long, hard process. It takes a fair amount of money. It, it takes a fair amount of time. Uh, let me just run through this briefly, because I'll be referring to these in, in the conclusions, or near the conclusions. I'll be referring to these phases here. Uh, the, the, the cheap part is done by us, the chemists, uh, and, and they don't give us very much time to do it, according to this scheme. But remember, this is the pharmaceutical industry screening scheme where they may have 100 chemists working on one project, whereas the guy conditions may have five or ten. But anyway, it's typically thought to take about two years in the discovery part, the preclinical, which is doing all the animal talks, the pharmacokinetics in animals, and all the collecting all the data that you need to be able to get uh, and that takes over two years. In phase two and phase three, in addition to looking at efficacy, setting the dosage in humans, you're also uh, continuing to look for safety issues unexpected toxicities, etc. Uh, so, in, in the end, if you do all of this, you can apply for F, uh, FDA approval, and if they approve it, then the drug can go to the market. So, that, that's the process which uh, you're facing, and it's certainly challenging uh, scientifically as well as now let's turn to more drug discovery focus, and I put a couple of reviews up here. Uh, the tropsin, which is a natural product, is a 
dye cation, baronyl, pentamidine, synthetic dye cations. Pentamidine has been in humans for 40 or 50 years, still has lots of toxicity uh, in these main infections. So it has quite a bit of use despite its toxicity. Contaminating, in my opinion, will never get into humans at the current time. I could not pass that rigorous regulatory process that And this is some of the uh, perceptions that uh, hinder the development of dying things. Well known toxicity of pentamidine is kind of attributed as a class effect and rather than a compound effect, and uh, it's very difficult to change those conclusions. Uh, very little is known about how it works. We have lots of hypotheses, but there's not solid data because nobody is spending money to get those questions. And even the pharmacokinetics. And of course, the compound has no bioavailability. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. That's, that's, a, that's a limit uh, of the uh, dicatons in general, as you certainly would expect. So they're very high to fill. Um, this is a slide that attempts to sort of summarize our design strategy. Uh, it is essential to have two positive charges. If you remove one of the amidine groups or replace it with some other type of cation center, you lose DNA affinity and you lose uh, biological activity. When we started this work some 15, 20 years ago, focusing on the minor group, it was uh, the dogma within was that it was essential to have a crescent-shaped molecule. Certainly, those type molecules are very nice, but you're going to see uh, a little later on in the presentation that uh, there are other shape molecules that work equally well. And this is the results that came from our lab. We spent a lot of time following up on it. You'll see some of that shortly. Um, so, we in general, you need a curved spacer or some other types of look at it in the The cationic charges are essential, as I've already said, the robotic electrostatic interactions and all two slots in the line group of DNA. Uh, hydrogen bonding donors or acceptors in this unit can, can add to the affinity and, and or to the selectivity. So we try to uh, introduce those strategically when we can. And a large part of the binding affinity is due to uh, Van der Waals interactions. Uh, from the aromatic rings binding to the minor group. Can, can you hear me? Sorry. It's kind of <laughs> So, is that better? Yes. 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 <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, you, you can see uh, some of the uh, points that I just made about binding on, on this slide and the next. This is a crystal structure that was obtained uh, by Stephen Needle in London. He's been a collaborator of ours for. 15 or 20 years. He's an expert on small molecule DNA crystallography. And you can see from this uh, graphic here that the molecule slides very snugly into the groove. You can, I think, imagine the Van Balls interactions between the walls of the groove and, and the planar surfaces. What you can't see is what the amidines are. Amidine groups are doing, but this 
um, mnemonic device here uh, illustrates that, I think. One of the uh, MD hydrogen bonds to the thiamine on one strand, the, at the other end of the pure MD, it hydrogen bonds to the thiamine on the opposite strand. And so you have a composite then of Van Gogh's interaction, hydrogen bonding interactions, electrostatic interactions, all of which uh, add up to the uh, affinity of, of this type of molecule. Now, I, I mentioned that curved molecules were thought to be essential some years ago. We thought that too. Um, but some work that has appeared from our lab in the last four or five years uh, certainly shows that that's not essential. It obviously, it works, but it's not essential. And for comparison here, we've got two molecules that one is crescent shape, much like uh, duramidine. The other is nearly linear. Uh, both have benzimidazole amidine units, and the spacers, the central spacers, are different, both in uh, uh, ring size, but also in, in the geometry that they enforce on the molecule. And you'll see that they are both give uh, pretty respectable antiparasitic activity. The DNA binding of both are extremely strong. Uh, the larger the TM, the, the stronger the affinity. And uh, so from, from that, certain, certain questions were raised. Uh, with this great DNA affinity, actually pretty impressive, against the uh, plasmodium falciparum, half an animal around C50, and yet it's not a curved molecule. Uh, so we were fortunate that... Uh, Again, Steve Needle in London was able to get crystal structures for both of these compounds. This is the, the curved molecule, and it, that crystal structure looks essentially like the pyramidine crystal structures. But the interesting one is the linear molecule. And we show two perspectives here. Um, the upper perspective, you can see it fits in the, into the minor group reasonably well, but when you look at it from on top, you you see that uh, the van der Waals interactions are not nearly so good as the curved structure. In fact, no, notice maybe a third of the molecule is sticking out in the water as opposed to being pulled into the group. Um, so, where does it get its affinity? Well, the, the, the red ball, which you can see a hint of right here, and more clearly right here, is representing a water molecule. So, it forms a, a water-mediated hydrogen bond. There's a hydrogen bond from the amidine NH to the water, and then a water-hydrogen hydrogen bonds to thiamine carbonyl. And remarkably enough, this complex uh, provides sufficient energy that it overcomes the loss of the uh, Van Gaal stacking uh, on you know, maybe a third, maybe not quite a third. But in any event, this gave us a new look at designing molecules for targeting the minor groove. And you'll see from the general slides that I'll show you in a moment, that we, we've spent a lot of effort in trying to uh, make linear molecules, and you'll see that they work pretty well. In fact, some, many of them are, are their in vitro data is actually better than the curved ones. Unfortunately, none of them have uh, given in vivo data of that same magnitude. So it, it's still a, uh, an area that needs uh, work, and uh, but it's quite promising. Well, let's take a bit more 
look at how these things might work. Uh, it's essential that they get into the parasite, obviously, if they're going to be effective. And this is just a micrograph of, of trypanosomes, the, the blue bodies, around the blood cells. And on this slide, we, we actually have a single trypanosome in the micrograph. This work is primarily done by Michael Barrett. Moscow um, on one of the pyramidine analogs. And you can see, and I'll show you a, a cartoon in a second, uh, but this is the kinetoblast, and this is the mitochondria of this parasite. And the, one of the characteristics which uh, Bassett mentioned yesterday is many of these compounds fluoresce very nicely, and this one is no exception. And uh, so this is just the natural fluorescence of the, of the dianity showing up in the uh, class and the uh, this, this is the, the cartoon uh, of the, the uh, organism. And what's important to notice is this area here, which is a time course study on adding, um, in this case, Garandi to, to uh, <coughs> the system, and at one hour, you can see, and this is, again, is the uh, kinetic class, mitochondria is not quite as obvious, these numbers, the, these um, representations are enhancements so that you can see them better. After four hours, I think you can see the biologist who did this assure me that uh, the intensity in the kinetic class is already dramatically decreasing. That in the mitochondria is more or less the same. After 24 hours, you don't see it in the kinetic class at all. And the argument is that um, the kinetoplast mini circles bind, bind to the mini circles in the kinetoplast, and that those, in fact, have been destroyed. Whether that's actually the case, you can never know for sure, but it certainly suggests that. So, we, we think that the molecules, clearly, the molecules get into the trypanosome. Exactly what they do after they get there, obviously, will require a performance amount of work. Even after doing that, it might still be debatable. But so, since we are confident that they mine the DNA, they get into the parasites, then we have spent a fair amount of time trying to make molecules that have reasonably good druggable properties, as, as the term these days is. What I want to do in the next few slides is just show you some classes of the compounds that we made. Uh, I'm not going to go, as I said, into the synthesis in detail, but just give you a quick overview of it. Actually, here is a summary table of the work, uh, which will allow me to tell you a little bit about the, the testing system. But the during the period that the Gates Foundation has funded us. We've made 700 of these things. We made about half that number of prodrugs. I'll be talking about prodrugs in a moment. Um, of the 700, 130 had IC50 values less than 10, 10 nanomoles. So, as a class, they're, they're really uh, highly active. It's the trypanosomes. But then you start winnowing down and uh, you see that of the 130 very good compounds, uh, only half that number give three or four cures at the standard screening dose in a mouse model uh, at five mg per kg uh, IP. Half of those give four out of four cures, completely cured. Let me just say a brief word about the two models, because I'll be talking about that in a moment. The STIP 900 model, which is 
Swiss Cop Institute.